Well, first off, it's a great pleasure to have the opportunity to talk today about our uh, diagnostic work. Uh, we've been working on aspects of this for uh, several years now. So what I'm going to do is kind of give you an overview of the technology that we're using, um, mostly on a foundational level, and then give you the bottom line of uh, our clinical trial data at this point. So this slide kind of outlines the, the strategy. Basically, uh, we wanted to de define uh, the presence of tuberculosis and primarily interested in the viable tuberculosis. So we're very interested in the viable organism, showing that the organism is present and alive, not just the host response or the presence of dead organisms, um, by looking at markers that are present on the surface. So we're looking at enzymes that are present on the surface of the bacteria. We're using substrates that are fluorogenic, so substrates that will generate a fluorescent signal um, after cleavage by those enzymes. So we're using a catalytic process to amplify signals of the presence of the bacteria. And the great advantage of this type of approach is that you can have almost infinite uh, amount of signal from a single bacilli. Um, the goal is that you would have a detection threshold that would be equivalent to the presence of a single bacteria and that would correlate well with viability of the organisms. So what we chose when we looked at the different um, enzymes that were present in TB and we, we have a lot of genomic data already available. We have proteomic data and transcription analyses done by microarray. So we have a full understanding of the genes that are present and the proteins that are present. And so looking at all of these, uh, we came to the conclusion that one of the best choices as a marker for tuberculosis would be BLAS E, which is a beta-lactamase enzyme. Um, that enzyme class is extremely robust. Um, in general, they're kinetic, so their ability to cleave a substrate are almost equal to that of substrate diffusion. So that high kinetic rate um, is pretty much better than any other enzyme in existence. Um, the half-life is relatively long, so it's a very stable enzyme. It's present for an extended period of time and gives you a very good opportunity for measuring its activity. In addition, aspects of its secretion are dependent on ATP. So it's dependent on the viability of the organism to be secreted. And so when you see reduction in ATP levels, you see a reduction in the presence of the enzyme on the surface of the bacteria. It's one of the most sensitive reporters known, uh, down to the possibility of even four molecules of enzyme. And so I had mentioned before that our uh, detection goal would be one bacteria. Uh, we imagine that one bacteria can produce thousands of molecules of enzyme rather than just four molecules of enzyme. So having a detection threshold of such a low number of enzymes uh, with available colorimetric, fluorescent, luminescent substrates uh, would be highly desirable for this type of test. Um, there also was a great deal of chemistry. So since lactamases have been around as an important marker for drug resistance in other bacterial species, we felt that uh, the chemistry that was involved in design of antibiotics and inhibitors would inform our design of substrates that would be fluorogenic, improved substrates that would be fluorogenic and be highly sensitive. Um, in addition, since antibiotics are not used for treatment of tuberculosis, uh, these lactam antibiotics are not used for treatment of, of tuberculosis, and this enzyme has been present since the ad, uh, prior to the advent of uh, antibiotics, there's no selective pressure for mutations in these genes, and we find that there's a 100% correlation with the organism in TB complex and the presence of this enzyme. So there wouldn't be any expectation for evolution or divergence away from the presence of this enzyme in the strain. And so we wouldn't have any loss of detection ability. And this is just an example of the detection thresholds with some of our earlier substrates that are cell permeable. Um, looking in macrophages, the bacteria are labeled in green and the cells themselves are labeled with blue with a nuclear stain here. And you can see the bacteria inside of the cells yet we can get very good detection of the bacteria with these stains and, and label those infected cells with these 
fluorogenic markers um, and not labeled uninfected cells. And an additional confirmation of this is shown by fax analysis. So you can actually sort fluorescent, large numbers of fluorescent cells using these markers. And you can see that uh, there's a very good correlation with the number of bacteria that are present and the fluorescent signal uh, for detection of the organism, suggesting that we can follow infected cells individually with this type of technology. So those initial substrates that we developed were just fluorogenic markers for the presence of the bacteria. And we wanted to take this a step further so that we could apply it to a diagnostic strategy. And one of the first things we had to look at is making specific substrates. Because there are other lactamases present in other bacteria, but luckily we found that in TB, we had the active site of the enzyme had a number of differences that allowed us to design very specific substrates. And the crystal structures had been previously done for this enzyme. So we modeled our chemical structures onto this enzyme and design substrates that fit within it like a key within a lock. And we found that only these keys affect tuberculosis, but do not detect the other um, lactamases that are present in other bacterial species. So it's highly specific at this point for tuberculosis. And this is the initial level of substrate specificity. And if you picked up the paper that was available um, outside of the room, you can, you can read through this in more detail. But basically, we were able to identify substrates in our first pass of substrates that have a specificity for tuberculosis, about a thousand-fold specificity for the tuberculosis blossy over TM1, which is one of the other lactamases that we use as a general lactamase enzyme for nonspecific substrates. And we've actually gone one step beyond this. We have about a 10 to 100-fold improvement on this now, uh, about a 10,000 to 100,000-fold 100 specificity over the substrates that detect other lactamases and other bacterial species. So it looks like we're making very good progress. And when you look at the fold increase in fluorescence upon, in the absence of this enzyme, you see that the fluorogenic substrate is working extremely well. We have about a 200-fold uh, increase in fluorescence in the presence of the enzyme as compared to the absence of enzyme. In addition, we showed that we get very good specificity. Is this detection of BCG, uh, which would be considered a, a model of a TB complex bacteria, and we're only detecting 10 bacteria here, we get very good signal as compared to 10 to the fifth E. coli expressing beta lactamase, a TEM1 like, or MRSA, the Staph aureus. Uh, beta-lactamase expressing strain, and PA01 expresses three different beta-lactamases, and we're looking at 10 to the fifth bacteria in that case. In addition, um, everyone should note that uh, Mycobacterium smegmatis, which is another mycobacteria that expresses a beta-lactamase, the beta-lactamase present in other mycobacterial species, non-tuberculosis complex, is extremely different. It actually has closer evolutionary relationship to lactamases in other bacterial species than it has to tuberculosis complex. So we don't detect other mycobacterial species um, as compared to uh, tuberculosis either. This is the correlation in sputum. So the question always is, how well does this type of uh, technology work in sputum, uh, which is a messy uh, uh, substance to work within? Uh, we found a very good correlation down to very low numbers of CFU with the presence of bacteria, and this is a linear correlation um, that, that looks very good at this point. So we took this a step further and wanted to see whether or not we could detect these in tubes. Um, basically, the detection system here is using an iPhone to take a picture through an LED light box. So two pieces of glass attached to this. This is actually constructed in somebody's garage for a very low cost. Um, and we put into Eppendorf tubes, standard Eppendorf tubes, uh, very low numbers of bacilli from you know, 1 to up to 10 to the 5th bacteria. And this is in the absence of the bacteria in sputum. So just standard non-decontaminated sputum. Could we detect this? And we find that, yes, we can detect very low numbers of bacteria in very short periods of time. This is within 10 minutes. Um, out to 30 minutes, we see a very good stability of the signal. So as compared to control background levels, we see very low signal with this system. So very low cost uh, handheld detection system in this case, uh, we were able to detect down to about 10 bacteria uh, relatively well. So we've gone forward with this now, and we've done almost 1,000 uh, clinical samples 
uh, with this, and we've done some variations on the protocol. Um, one of the things that we've been focused on primarily is identifying protocols that would work well in a very low resource setting. So all of the pro procedures are done at room temperature. Um, they require no technical capabilities. Uh, basically, you're taking sputum in a cup, and the substrate is then added to it. It's mixed with a wooden stick, and then put into a plate reader or any other type of fluorescent reader. And as I already mentioned, um, the type of detection systems that we're using are, are basically an LED, which is very low cost, and two pieces of glass, which allow passage of the fluorescence wavelength that we're interested in through that glass to a detection system. So you can use almost any camera device for detection of these systems. So extremely low cost. Usually, um, most of the detection t systems that we're looking at now are below $500 for putting in place, and the detection system obviously isn't used up. And the throughput is, um, you know, you can detect a single sample in seconds. Um, so it doesn't take time to uh, do this detection system. So using this system and screening, this is just an example of about uh, 20 samples uh, that are clinical samples from Houston, 50% uh, of which were positive. Um, the negatives here are that they were de not detected by uh, smear microscopy, but were detected by culture. And the positive positives are detected by both microscopy and culture. You can see that the fluorescent uh, detection system, this is the threshold cutoff uh, set by ROC analysis. Um, you can see that we can detect well both uh, non-smear positive but culture positive as well as smear positive, culture positive. So we have very good correlation with our detection methods in these of both culture and smear uh, positive samples. This is a look at the device that we're uh, currently looking at uh, for end users. Uh, this is just a simple reader. Um, as I mentioned before, these devices uh, um, will probably retail less than $500 each. Um, the cups, where basically it's designed on the standard sputum cup, uh, it will have a lyophilized sample in it, so it can be transported at room temperature, as well as possibly a liquid reservoir that will contain primarily just water in it, but it maintains the, the integrity of the water source that we're using. And then it'll be a twist activation for this that will allow activation and uh, combination with the substrate. And then it'll be put into this drawer in the reader and read directly there in, in a matter of a few seconds. Uh, Global Biodiagnostics is the, the company that is involved in development of this technology and has uh, developed this product design. So our clinical trial results up to this point, um, uh, what we've been doing is basically putting the sputum into a transport stabilization solution. This maintains the viability and integrity of the solution over time. We're looking at being able to maintain it in this stabilization uh, solution from 1 to 24 hours at room temperature, where whatever that room temperature is, and we're looking at temperature fluctuations. Uh, in depth right now to make sure that everything stays stable at pretty much any uh, room temperature or environmental temperature where this might be transported in the solution. So as it's transported and then we're envisioning that it's taken to uh, some sort of lab or doctor's office uh, as close to uh, the patients as possible and there is where it's then combined with the substrate as it's put into the reader. Um, it is read at 10 minute time point, so um, and that ten, at that 10 minute time point, it's read um, in about a second or five seconds. So you can put in uh, as many samples as you need. You can either use a plate reader for this, an iPhone, or an REF to a specific reader that I've talked about already. Currently, we're using plate readers for this, um, and I showed you the pictures from the iPhone. So we obtained a, a, a hundred and samples, this is actually 120 samples. I think actually 26 of these were from Houston. A hundred of these were from Find. Um, so they were uh, both from endemic settings and from the US. Uh, unprocessed clinical samples, sputum, uh, exclusively for this uh, examination. Uh, we had a 93% correlation with smear positive, culture positive, and an 
uh, correlation with smear negative, culture positive. So it suggests that the sensitivity is very good, uh, very close to culture, at least at present, um, and correlating extremely well with smear positivity. The specificity was a little bit lower, um, almost 80%, about 77%. Our target is about 80% on this. Um, so we're getting more false positives than we would like at this point. Um, we suspect that there was an issue with the pH from the fine samples, and we're still investigating that, uh, what was the issue with the pH of those fine samples. Um, but we're using buffering to eliminate that, and we've also developed some additional protocol, protocol modifications that will uh, reduce these problems with specificity. Uh, so that's where things sit at this point. Uh, we're extremely excited about this because it's extremely sensitive. You can see that this protocol basically is a single step of addition of the substrate, uh, very quick turnaround. Um, we can get the samples within uh, minutes after they're uh, produced and then read them directly. Um, this is the team that has been involved in the development up to this point. This is my group. Uh, mostly postdoctoral fellows and graduate students involved. Uh, our funding uh, for attendance to this meeting is from Global Biodiagnostics for me, and I have a disclosure for this because I'm also a founder of this company um, and a consultant for them in the past, and I have stock in that company as well. Uh, their funding has come from Wellcome Trust um, and my own funding for the development of the substrates and analysis of these initially came from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. So both the Wellcome Trust and uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation have put funds into these. Uh, collaborations uh, with Global Biodiagnostic, Michael, Michael Norman is here today, um, but Ed Gravis at Methodist uh, Hospital has provided the samples from Texas, which are primarily from Houston. Uh, Jiang Hong Rao has been the one that at Stanford University has developed the chemistry. Uh, there's a lot of chemistry that has gone into the substrate development and the specificity, uh, very elegant design. And, and Jim Secatini, also at Texas A&M, uh, was involved in the structural analysis and modeling to develop the specificity of the substrates. And I'm um, stopping there, so let me know if you have any questions.